it's been two months since we were last racing in the European Le Mans series. The reason for that, the annual pause for the 24 hours of Le Mans, which of course saw lots of European Le Mans series teams taking part, but not a round of their championship. So the 11th of July in Italy, in North Italy, in Monza, was the last time that these cars were out in action. And there are now two events still to go. The first here at Spa-Francorchamps in Belgium, and then next month in what, about five weeks time, we will end the season at Portimao now on the south coast of Portugal. So much to be decided. Some of it, and a real stretch, might be this weekend. But three classes to be qualified over the next best part of 40 minutes. But these are short, short sessions. And it's Graham Goodwin and Johnny Palmer to keep you company. Great to be back with the Championship, Graham. It's great to be back with the Championship and great to see Spa in sunny climbs and with some fans here at Trackside as well, Johnny. And what could be an extraordinary qualifying session? Why? because so far we've had four races and four different pole position setters in this class for GTE. And very oddly, the uh, the car that hasn't set a pole position is the championship leader. We've not had a pole position for the number 80 Iron Lynx car. We saw pole uh, at Monza for the 55 Spirit of Race car that sits second in the points. We saw pole at the Red Bull Ring from the third place car, the 88 AF Corsa car. Pole at the opening race of the season at Barcelona for the Proton Competition car. And then the somewhat outlier, actually ninth in the points, but Le Castellet did see the TF Sport Aston Martin set pole position. So uh, it is only a point, but we've seen time and time again that those points really can make a difference at the end of a long four season. Here is the, the 77 car, Christian Reed, Cooper McNeil, and Matt Campbell back in this car for, I think, the second time this season, replacing Jimmy Bruni. As the Porsche factory drivers just cycle through. Hmm. Great looking livery on that car. It's also a nice reserve to fall back on. You're quite right. Matt Campbell was in action at Red Bull Ring earlier in the year. So back for another dose of ELMS running. When you look at the uh, team's championship then within uh, GTE, it's a, it's a points gap of just six to the current championship leaders. Also, we should bear in mind the success ballast because that's rather penalised the number 80 car this weekend because it's been performing so well, not only in the previous two races, but also in the championship. It is possible to run with an extra 45 kilos at most. They haven't quite got that, but they have got 40 kilos for company in car 80. There are two other cars with weight. The 55 Spirit of Race Ferrari with 35 kilos and car 88, the AF Corsa Ferrari for Francois, Francois Perodo, Manu Collard and Alessio Rivera. They will have just 15 kilos in the passenger seat. And that's one to watch. They have been very quick indeed throughout this season. Missed the opening round and that's left a dent in their championship hopes. They've also been a form team in the uh, FI World Endurance Championship as well. This car runs as 83 in that championship and has been a uh, very much a contender. Uh, outroll a couple of the Iron Lynx cars, the number 95 Aston Martin from TF Sport, ready to come off its jacks once the uh, tyres have been fitted. John Hartshaw and Ross Gunn, Ollie Hancock aboard that car. And uh, all sorts of possibilities, by the way, for this squad moving forward into 2022. Watch this space for exactly what we'll see from TF Sport. Well, murmurs of uh, maybe even wanting to run a, a GT Pro car in the future. All sorts of possibilities. Nothing okay. yet uh, nailed down by uh, Tom Ferry and his very hard-working squad. Uh, but uh, there are some surprises to come there. In my ex experience of Tom's team within ACO Rules Racing, they've always been broad thinkers. Oh, yeah. So uh, the ideas are big enough. Uh, just a question of uh, what uh, actually manifests in reality. But yeah, exciting times. They've got the 95 car, of course, there for John Hartsort. Uh, although it's unlikely he'll be doing the qualifying because unlike with the Michelin Le Mans Cup, your choice of driver for quali in ELMS is entirely free and tending, therefore, to be favoured are the gold-rated drivers, with the possible exception of 88, because Alessio Rivera has been put out for the odd quali session and he's the silver-rated driver. In these cars, you have to have a bronze. Your second choice can be bronze or silver, and then your third choice is up to you. So platinum, gold, most teams go with one or the other. Good news going on. The number 93 Porsche from Proton Competition. Green flag for this session is shown. And another chance to see these glorious GTE machines, whose years are now numbered, by the way. Uh, we now know there is a transition timetable established from the ACO for 
the end of the GTE era and what a fabulous era it has been. So we continue as we are with the WEC for with the, both the GTE Pro and AM classes for one more year. Then it will be GTM only. Mm. And then the following season transitions into some form of GT3 based competition across the platforms. And that will be 2024. Correct. So two more years after this, at least to enjoy these cars within 2023, uh, limited to just AM lineups. Uh, but they will be a big miss, certainly. Michael Fassbender taking a watching brief during qualifying, but they will be leaning on his talents massively when we get to the race tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Could well be enabled as the starter. I haven't seen a starting grid yet, but uh, your um, when you have de your declaration of your starting driver needed to be in before this session took place. He did. So drivers out there for this session, the 55 car spirit of race will be David Perel. Paolo Roberti is aboard the number 60 on Lynx car. Jody Fannin in the the 66 JMW Motorsport Ferrari Proton Competition 77 Matt Campbell Porsche factory driver Miguel Molina Ferrari factory driver in the 80 Iron Links uh, Michelle Gatting it is aboard the Iron Links number 83 of the Iron Dames car Alessio Rivera quite right in the AF Corsa 88 93 in the hands of Ricard Leitz another factory driver this time from Porsche and finally Ross Gunn another factory driver Aston Martin flavour this time aboard the 95 TF Sport car and if we're not going to get a repeat pole sitter, then it cannot be getting pole in this session. The 77 Porsche, the 88 Ferrari, the 55 Ferrari of Spirit of Race, all the 95 TF Sport Aston Martin. I've nothing against any of those teams, and let's see whether they can become the first double pole winner. But I kind of quite like, if we can go through the whole season with six different cars in pole, that would be yeah. superb. That yeah. would be absolutely excellent. And of those, I think the one we're looking at that's the prime contender is this one. This is the number 80 Iron Lynx car in the hands of Miguel Molina. Gives himself a wide line through there. Get maximum launch down, start, finish straight to start his lap. On board with David Burrell from South Africa. New addition to the Spirit of Race number 55 outfit this year. They've had a race win with Alessandro Pierguidi helping the team out. And again, he's taking tippy-toe through the bus stop to give himself a launch on what will be his first flyer. Well, this team, by the way, very much in title contention this year. And again, it's an interesting choice to go with Perel for qualifying. I suppose, you know, Matt Griffin knows just about everything it's possible to know about these Ferraris these days, so has nothing to prove, whereas Perel, there's still that room for improvement quite possibly. There's a big lock up there for Ross Gunn into Lassau's corner in the 95 Aston Martin. He collected it well, barely breached the track limits. Not a lock up in that instance. That's an Aston Martin. He's pressed the wrong button on the uh, James Bond uh, <laughs> That's <laughs> dashboard. A smoke, smoke screen, That's right. Is it? Yeah. Just have to make sure it doesn't touch the machine guns on the ejector seat yes. and uh, we'll be absolutely fine through goes the 95 hopefully not too much damage to the tyre there because otherwise that could be a bit of a bone shaker for the young Brit who's impressing not only here in the European Le Mans series but also in title contention over the IMSA Weather Tech Sports Car Championship with Harder Racing great uh, stuff going on there with Ross 83 car goes through in the hands of Danish driver Michel Gatting and in the wheel tracks of Miguel Molina, the number 80 car, we start to see the quick sectors coming through. These are 12 minute sessions, by the way, increased very slightly from the usual 10 because of the length of the track. We've already had a quarter off that, so it doesn't take long at all to burn through 12 minutes of time. You will be able to extend the session if you cross the line with seconds to spare, but the chequered flag's not being shown. You can force an extra lap out of it, but that's really down to a bit of luck rather than judgment often, and depending on where your car is come the end of the 12 minutes. Feel the links is the hashtag on the uh, COVID mask for a variety of team members down there then at uh, Sir Iron Links. The 80 car swinging through amazingly. Uh, Son pole position so far. Is there a chance in this session? Miguel Molina leading the championship crosses the line and the benchmark figure is a 2 minutes 17.3, Graham. It is indeed, but I think that's going to be better as Michel Gatting, I think, lost a lap time there, as did Paolo Roberti. So the only other car that set a time is Ross Gunn. He's some 1.3 seconds back. Ricard leads, though it is, that goes to the top and it's a mighty lap for Ricard. It's a 2.16.093, 1.3 seconds quicker than Miguel Molina as Matt Campbell pits the 77 car. 
Michael Fassbender's eyes lit up there and he realised his car was at the top, just homing into the screen itself to make sure he picked out the time. 2.16 dead. The other Porsche, run by Christian Reed's outfit, had came into the pits though, and that is not part of the plan. Matt Campbell must have encountered an issue uh, because you cannot afford, well, certainly two stops. Sometimes the cars do stop mid-session for a new set of tyres, but the 77 is in, I sense, for a problem. Maybe a slow puncture, perhaps he felt a vibration. It's all four tyres being changed on the 77 so whether or not that was planned I don't know it wasn't very hurried was it? No. That pit stop through comes the number 88 car and to Alessio Rivera what can he produce he comes through and is third at the moment. 2.16 more or less dead for Ricard Leeds plays 2.17.3 for Miguel Molina 2.17.4 for Alessio Rivera. David Perel at 2.18.1 and we haven't yet seen times from Paolo Roberti in the 69 Lynx Ferrari, Matt Campbell, as mentioned, in the 77 Porsche, and the Iron Lynx Ferrari of uh, Michel Gatting, number 83, as over the top of Radion goes the 88 car of AF Corsa and Alessio Rivera, clear road in front of him. Admittedly, only nine cars in the session, so it's a bit easier to find that clear road compared to what will be a very busy session next with 16 LMP3s in it, down towards Le Fang corner for David Perel currently fourth fastest 218.1 but he's up so far through the first sector uh, other laps under investigation will bring you details of that if there's a ruling that we're going to lose any but it includes a lap for David Perel it includes Jody Fannin's lap in the 66 car and Ricard Leitz uh, which will be his current lap I'm sure uh, appears to have bailed out from any kind of pace on that lap which would, uh, would which would indicate that's probably correct so Ricard Leitz it is ahead of Miguel Molina who's on pit road now presumably for a change of tyres on that number 80 car also in Paolo Roberti and Michel Gatting so all three Iron Lynx cars on pit road together just over 1.2 seconds, the deficit for Miguel Moliner between he and uh, Richard Leitz, but both cars are in, are in, as Graham says, for a change of Goodyear Eagle tyres. No restriction on tyres in this category. So you can just keep throwing new rubber at these machines, particularly they'll be doing that in qualifying and stickered Goodyears all round, unsurprisingly for the 93 car. I'm sure Richard Leitz will say it was far from the perfect lap. Some bits were good, other bits not ideal, and there is room for a little bit more how much can he shave from the 216 he occupies all three absolute best times during that uh, run of three laps in total but actually only two flying laps he did a fly he did an out lap a flyer and then an in lap and uh, did his best lap on lap two unsurprisingly but out again he will go three and three quarter minutes left plus any extra that you might be able to gain uh, from the session as the Aston Martin reaches Eau Rouge still with Ross Gunn at the wheel. Improvements from Jody Fannin, fifth place for the number 66 JMW Ferrari. It's a 218.4 for Jody. That's 2.3 seconds back at the moment. There is time, though, to improve for the 66 car. By the way, still in its Le Mans uh, art car livery. Good spot, yes. And so through Bruxelles corner goes 83. I haven't seen any driver changes. It was just purely for change of tyres. It wasn't time to get a driver out and belt it in again. So Ricard Leitz, Miguel Molina will continue their scrap at the sharp end. Possibly slightly concerning for the Spaniard is that it is a 1.2 second gap. Can that Ferrari find the, the speed and maybe indicative of how good the Porsche is through clean air on the straights because you've got obviously that very fast run out of La Source through Eau Rouge and Radion, Kemmel straight, Blanchemont, that's where the Porsche is finding all the time. I think the Ferrari is better through the twisty bits. It's a quick lap underway from Jody Fanning, but it's a quicker lap underway from Matt Campbell in the number 77 car. Remember, with no lap time currently on the board, but he's gone purple through sector one and is looking very racy here indeed down towards Pouan goes Matty Campbell and out of the second of the left hand there's loads of runoff there but you don't want to be using any of it and into Lufania where you've got less runoff and uh, gravel trap on the the second element of that, which has caught out a few in recent years. In fact, there was uh, during the WEC weekend earlier on in the year, I seem to remember GR Racing came a cropper on the out lap there and then couldn't take part in the race. Correct. So, yeah, some difficulties through the course of the years as now out of...
Campos corner and curve Paul Frere. Matt Campbell, the Australian, will head back up the hill, slightly inclined this bit towards the bus stop chicane. Let's see what he's capable of. He's purple through first and the second sectors. And can he make it a trio of success here to go ahead of Ricard Leitz, having not even posted a time yet, Matt? Indeed. It could be a 1-2 here for Proton Competition. Out from the bus stop, power down. And looks to be on his way to a provisional pole position too. No, he's not. He's not, he's not. by 17 thousandths of a second. It is a Proton 1 2, but not in the order I think we expected. Uh, it's Ricard Leeds from Matt Campbell. 93 retains pole position. And that will, I'm sure, just encourage Matt Campbell to bigger efforts. It's a lock up coming into the bus stop. That was the first oh, no, corner. First corner. First, must, corner. Must first, cup, first corner of the next lap, maybe. Uh, because the 77 was good through that first sector that runs all the way to the top of the hill. He's lost the lap. I was just as he saw that lock up, I wondered whether or not that was track limits, and he's lost that lap. So he still has not set a time. So Despite that, having two purple sectors, he's not set a time. That was at the start of lap five, the one we were calling all the way through it. So all of a sudden, the gap from 17 thousandths of a second and real pressure for Ricard Leitz stretches back out to 1.2 seconds. It's as you were between Leitz and Miguel Molina with Alessio Rivera sort of waiting in the wings, really. Again on new tyres in the 88 AF Corsa Ferrari. That Ferrari has had a pole position earlier on in the year in May at Red Bull Ring. The 93 has not. So we are on course again for a different pole sitter, potentially. We are, but uh, currently on track and out there on schedule to take pole positions. The checker flag comes out. Ross Gunn goes quicker. Loses a chunk, though, in the middle sector, quicker than he's gone before, but loses the advantage he was holding through his sector one time over the current pole position sitter. But it looks to me like Ross Gunn has got every opportunity here to make a big improvement. And all of a sudden, Matt Campbell has got to go conservative. He's got to put a conservative lap time in just to get onto uh, somewhere onto this grid. So it's pretty bit of a disaster there. What's happened there? That was Miguel Molina improving. Michel Gatting goes third. So it's Miguel Molina uh, under a second, but takes the checkered flag and will not and improve. Deleted. And Gatting's deleted from Michel Gatting. Yeah, yeah. So she won't have a time. No. Because every other lap's been deleted as well. So Michel Gatting needed to be conservative. I was just about to say, Matty Campbell and conservative in the same sentence. It's near enough impossible. But uh, he might be right. The 77 is certainly now not posting uh, purple times. And Campbell. Went, he, well, he got a time and then he had it taken away from him again. He 93, did. no, well, 77 has not been confirmed as a time deleted, but he doesn't have a time. He, he, he went was up briefly to, fourth. He was briefly fourth and he's lost that one as well. Car 93, the lap deleted. Well, it's been an ill-disciplined session, hasn't it? I think we've had more laps deleted than we've had actually counting here. Just uh, Relicio Rivera to come through. He's going to improve on this lap. I think he might. 217.4. 2.72 is an improvement by a couple of tenths, but he stays third. Ricard leads it will be. And the 93 squad, as you see Michael Fassbender uh, celebrating there. The 93 car proton competition, despite the fact that Ricard Leitz lost his last lap time as well, uh, will be, well, after a somewhat staccato session there, uh, pole position alongside will be the number 80 car from Iron Lynx, a car that still has not set a pole position yeah. time this season. So that's five consecutive uh, pole position setters, different pole position setters, that don't include the championship leader. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? So the door is wide, what kind of goal is wide open for the 80 car to score its first pole position, perhaps at Portimao, and make it six different teams, well not six different teams, six different cars with pole positions this year, but uh, it continues the run, which is great from my perspective, because yep. it shows how even, how balanced this fight in GTE is. I think weight has something to do with that, because the 80 car is carrying 40 extra kilos, remember, because of its position in the championship, leader, because it won the previous race, and because it was second in the previous race to that as well. So it's always based on the last two results and the current championship positions. 
and there's a sliding scale applied accordingly. So the 80 car might have to wait, well, we'll have to wait now to the final round of the season, if at all it gets a pole position. And of course, crucially, that single point might be enough to win the championship. It's only six points that separate Iron Links and the 80 car from the 55 Spirit of Race, who were the winners last time out at Monza. They also took pole position in Italy. So Proton competition with the 93 car getting the first pole position for that car this year, a 216.093. Great driving from Ricard Leitz by 0.8 of a second from the championship leaders, number 80 Iron Lynx and Miguel Molina. Alessio Rivera third for AF Corsa and the 88 team. The 60 Iron Lynx Ferrari of Paolo Roberti left it very, very late. He only managed to get one time that was recorded, but it put him fourth, a 217.5. Ahead of Ross Gunn's lone Aston Martin, number 95. The last time winners, 55 Spirit of Race and David Perel. Jody Fannin, JWM Mot JMW Motorsport, the 66 and Matt Campbell, who was up there and then taken away and got to fourth and then had a time deleted as well. He will finish, sadly, with no time to his name. Let's get Reaction from Team 93 now with Hayley Edmonds in the pit lane. I'm joined here by Felipe Lazia, driver of a car number 93. Felipe, what a fantastic start to uh, Spa Francochon here with the pole position uh, taken by Ricard Leeds. It's first pole of the year, but you also got pole here last year. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually, uh, it's nice to be here. Eh? I mean, obviously, um, experience pay, pays off and uh, Richie did an amazing job. So just tell us about the course, the, um, the circuit in itself. Is it something all the team feel comfortable with? I mean, to be honest, it's quite a, I mean, obviously it's a long track. It's very tricky, a lot of high speed sections and uh, yeah, it's not an easy track. Huh? So you have to put everything together and obviously he did it in a proper way. Uh, every sector was, I guess, one of the quickest. So yeah, that's it. And what are, you, are going to be the biggest challenges for you tomorrow? Um, somehow to, to manage the traffic and just to have a nice and clean race and uh, let's see how, how it works with the safety cars and so on. I think strategy is quite an important thing, but uh, to be honest, just have a nice and clean race and hopefully uh, yeah, we can stay on this position. Eh? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Felipe Fernandez Laza, who will share the 93 Emerald Green Proton Competition Porsche then with Michael Fassbender and with the guy that set the time. Uh, Richard Leitz, he, uh, from, Fernando, from Felipe Fernandez's point of view, um, missed Ricard. I'm not sure whether that was a clash maybe to his Nürburgring uh, commitment. It was Nürburgring, yes. Yes, it was, of course, Nürburgring 24 hours that weekend. Yeah. So uh, that's the reason why he sat out. But otherwise, uh, he's done the other three rounds at Barcelona, Red Bull Ring and Monza. Nice to hear from him. Um, and yeah, uh, it just shows how close this, now we know, outgoing category in a few years' time is. But uh, at least we, for, we, for, for 2023, we know we retain the AM combination and that really works in the European Le Mans series for me. It does, it's been a, a fine foil for the European Le Mans series, great racing the three major classes plus of course the LMP2 Pro-Am class, so a fourth class, well, class within a class if you like. This is the 20 team Virage LMP3 car as so we're about to see the junior prototypes out on track and again Johnny uh, we've got plenty of cars still at least mathematically in the hunt, I think it's six mathematically and theoretically could still do it. Yeah, because it's basically 80 minus 52, I assume you've done, yep. and uh, work out what, who is in that bubble. Uh, but uh, yeah, Matt Bell and Nicola Molini, together with teammate Nicholas Scruton, will lead the championship on 80 points. With Laurence Hoor, he's had a change of teammate fairly frequently, so he's there on his own in second position on 67. So that's 13 back, and then a bigger gap back to Martin Hipper and Hugo de Vilda from Inter Europol competition. Yep, then the fourth place car is this car, that's number two, uh, two United Autosports car, the defending champions of course, they're back on 41 and a half points, RLRM Sports 15 is fifth with 32 points and on that critical 28 points is the second into Europol car. It is mathematical. Uh, it would require an extraordinary series of events, but uh, who's betting against that European Le Mans series? The orange and black for MV2S Racing with Fabien Leven probably put in for qualifying. We'll confirm the quality drivers in a moment or two. This is going to be the busiest of the three sessions, though. Only 12 minutes and 16 cars, all being well, will take part in it. The two teammates into Europol competition in their near-identical colour schemes, the yellow and the green, both Ligier JSP3 
20s. All the LMP3s powered by the same type of Nissan 5.6 litre V8 engine, by the way. It's a thirsty lump these days and uh, can just about make the distance on the three stops. But remember, when we get to the race tomorrow, two of the stops will have to be to a minimum pit stop reference time. And the other stop, wherever you take it in the race, can be as quick as the team could turn the car around. Absolutely. Got to get a little shot there. We've got a number of families here. I'm sure Rocky Land is uh, on the agenda there. Is that a future Iron Dame? I'm almost certainly sure. I, I wonder whether it might have been Dorian Pan, actually. I have to take a double, <laughs> cl double glance at it. Dorian Pan, 16 years old, will be part of the Michelin Le Mans Cup race later today. Uh, Looking glorious. Bar in the uh, In the bright sunshine, we've had uh, hot air balloons, balloons in balloons, for the last couple of uh, evenings over the circuit. As uh, the LMP3 cars get ready to go for their qualifying session. This is the Racing Experience car from Luxembourg, the number 12 car, run by the Hauser family. Huge success in international hill climbs and mm. looking for a leg up into endurance racing. Yeah, David and Gary uh, spent a long time in the uh, Michelin Le Mans Cup, at least a couple of seasons, maybe three actually, and they took a, a weekend to, to drive and then the, the next weekend they would sit out because they would switch and change between the two. But at least now being part of the ELMS, there's room for both the Hauser brothers, both silver rated and joined by a uh, driver at his home event, uh, the bronze rated Tom Cloet who was involved in that weird incident at Le Mans where yep. he T-boned a spun Sophia Flersch. Um, and uh, there were plenty of yellow flags being waved at the time. Very odd one. The cars get ready to literally rumble. The RFID uh, readers at the end of pit lane for the tyres in the European Le Mans series. There's the number five again. And B2S and have had an eye-catching season. The results haven't quite come, but you can sort of see Ten, that's a team nine, that could break through. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Pit line is now open. Pit line is now open. Please remind drivers of the need to respect track limits. Now, Any lap we see or which is reported by the judges, the fact is being done beyond track limits will be immediately deleted. Sorry, Eduardo. I thought we'd finished. Not quite. Uh, MV2S Racing, uh, best result last time out, actually. Eighth place, so that's yep. sixth. Yeah, yep. Sorry, ninth place. Eight points, sixth place. But they've been up there. Yes. And, um, they've been one of those, those teams that's just had a little bit of misfortune here and there. Bit of contact, not always there, of their doing. There's a result coming for that team, I'm sure of it. Yeah. Without a shadow of a doubt, they're a team that is looking set to just, just break the code of prototype racing. They came to the European Le Mans series after an introduction to this paddock last season with both the Ligier European Series and Michelin Le Mans Cup. And, uh, on board now with Lance Hur, who's been, no doubt, the star of the season in LMP3. Has just found somewhere a lot of speed. <laughs> well, uh, DKR Engineering, with all its dominance in the Michelin Le Mans Cup, that was going to spread through into ELMS for me. I mean, it's looking fairly unlikely DKR will win Le Mans Cup this year and that'll be the first team that hasn't been from Luxembourg with the title DKR Engineering to take the title yep. but does that is that because the strength of their drivers has actually gravitated or been promoted into LMP3 in European Le Mans series uh, level 13 points away from Cool Racing who have just sort of stealth-like worked their way to the top of the charts. Great driving from uh, all involved in the number 19 car. So you've got uh, Matt Bell as the silver-rated driver, Nicholas Cruton, and then Nicola Molini, who's one of the quicker bronze drivers in the LMP3 category. And so often the cream rises to the top. Well, that's happened a, a few times with that team. They've won two of the four races and a second place in the third, just off the podium last time out at Monza. But on 80 points, that's a great haul from just four races. Um, and with six races now, we're back to six races in ELMS. We only ran five yesterday, although of course the original plan was to do six, but the pandemic rather got in the way. Um, you can afford one duff resort, I would say, and still just. take the title. As the 19 comes straight back into the pits. But they haven't yet had an off weekend. And uh, well, let's hope for their, their sakes that it continues the way it's done so far this season. 
Well, uh, hang on to your hats because this is a session that usually produces real fireworks and it is absolutely one of those sessions. We said it before uh, when talking about the initial under one cup just a little early this afternoon, Johnny. It's one where someone who might have actually had a bit of track limits or not quite got one together out of nowhere shoots to the top of the timing uh, timing screen. So that's tyres going on for the 19 car. So they'll be setting a quicker time later in the session than some. So we've got uh, some of the leading cars at the moment. Colin Noble, David Drew, Matthias Kaiser all out in their flying, first flying laps right now. And here it is with a purple sector on his first attempt in sector one. There was that just an effort from Cool Racing to get more? Oh, oh big incident for the 12 car racing experience. Uh, and the 12 car, which was being driven by David Hauser, causes it's a, red a red flag. flag. And there's two cars involved. And MV2S it is. also off the road. Well. That's, on the, that's before Eau Rouge, isn't it? On the run down the hill. And then the car was off at Radion. So I'm not sure whether they were connected. That's a big hit. Yes. Gone backwards into the tyre wall. I mean, the tyres, what tyre wall, four or five deep there after huge incidents just this year at that point of the circuit. But it's quite a way after Radion yeah. Corner. So a moment probably over the top of the hill, which has then continued further down the road, not quite made the kink onto the Kemmel Strait. And racing experience, number 12, David Hauser. We were talking about the Hausers at length prior to this incident. And the marshals are quickly over to... To David's aid looks like he's able to undo the belts himself and potentially climb out but they are obviously in conversation with David Hauser because he's at this point he is climbing news. out yeah. at this point the body thinks it can maybe do a bit more than it is capable of but I'm pleased to see that he is in full conversation with the marshals yeah. rescue unit will be making its way and the MV2S incident I just think that's a car slowing down and potentially just no power for Fabian Leverne it's difficult to know exactly where that is, but I think it's just before the kink at Eau Rouge. Okay. On the road, on the run down, so it's pulled off at driver's it's left. It's not, it's not, it's down at turn five. Ah, okay. So very close to, no, it's not made the end of the first sector, but it could be anywhere ah, within that. Ah, it's good just point. that the timing system hasn't picked it up at the end of the sector. Just the angle of the car, looks like it's pointing downhill. It does. But it's a very tight shot on this car. Yeah, absolutely so. spot on, Johnny. Well spotted. So he's just rolled to a halt by the look of it. I've learnt spa over the years. There was a time when I'd never actually You'd been, never been to spa, Frank. Really? So many people can't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my first visit to spa was the first time ELMS came back here and it became a six round season. So three or four years ago. Yes, I was trying to actually establish just how many times I've kind of been here uh, watching a few more racing. Than that. A little more than that. It's, um, I think, 40 plus. Uh, wow. It's an odd thing for a UK based enthusiast follower of the racing but I suspect that Silverstone may be the only other circuit in the world that I've actually been to racing more than here with a variety of uh, ACO rules and SRO rules racing plus others down through the years but uh, not a good start to the session for either the number 5 and in particular the number 12 car but, uh, recovery of the 5 will be reasonably straightforward the 12 well They'll have to send the skip truck out, I'm afraid, for that one. That's not good news for racing experience. It's the action end of the car as well, where the gearbox is, the engine bay just before the incident scene. Now, the doctor's car has picked up David Hauser to take him to the medical centre. That is a, just a question of uh, protocol absolutely, um, normal practice. Um, but the fact that he was able to get out of the car under his own steam is promising before we speak too soon on his health. And uh, any news we do get uh, a little later on, obviously we'll get that to you. But uh, the MV2S car now craned out of the way by the Mercedes truck. And unfortunately, the session thrown into a red flag where no times have been set so far. Indeed. And there's only eight and a half minutes left on the clock. The clock's been paused because that always happens in qualifying sessions, unlike free practice. But all of a sudden, the 12-minute session becomes nearly, three, uh, nearly two thirds of that. And you've got to do an outlap and then find time for a quick one too. Yeah. So onto the flatbed eventually will go the Ligier. Sitting down at the back there rather more than looked comfortable to put that car safely down, but uh, I'm sure they've got their eyes on that. Interesting to me to look at the underneath of the car. I don't get to see that very no, often, but there's uh, not a great deal of sort of ground effect there. It's just a flat surface 
with the v with the point at the end which allows the air to be uh, displaced at the back through sort of a rear diffuser um, but it's got to work its way around those two bullets as well that are the, it, it, right behind the two rear wheels because I think th these cars under the rule that when you look at the back of the cars you cannot see, you, legally you can't see any of the rear tyres interesting um, to see on the left hand side the what do you call those kind of cylinders there to secure the tyre stacks so they're kind of flexible cylinders but they're there to secure the position of the tyre stacks so clearly there's some movement required to get them back into some order that's a big hit to that left-hand corner, left-hand rear corner of there's that no, car. There's no rear left tyre no. or wheel on that car any longer, with an awful lot of the sp suspension torn out as well. Got to say, that's the, the, that immediately you've got to say there are doubts as to whether or not we'll see that car again this weekend. Well, they've got all night, if needed, to try and fix it, but it just depends whether the, the, sh the chassis has been done underneath. You know, if, it, if it's done the tub, as the old expression goes, then that will be game over, unfortunately, for the penultimate race of the season. 11 o'clock start local tomorrow morning. Yeah, I must admit, I was trying to explain the phrase, done the tub, to someone who doesn't have English as a first language earlier today. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's a tricky one. But uh, clearly what it means is chassis damage that can't be repaired here at the circuit. And uh, it's uh, these LMP3 cars... Unlike the LMP2s, which are a full carbon monocoque, it's a full uh, covered body, if you like, all in carbon. That's not what you've got underneath this sleek body work, the P3 cars. It's effectively a carbon fibre tub. The lower part of the body is a carbon fibre tub, but with a, a traditional steel roll cage forming the top of the crash structure on these cars. Uh, enormously strong, significantly cheaper than yeah. an LMP2 uh, basic chassis. Yeah, and that's the point of the, the design of these cars. Correct. There, you don't scrimp and save on safety, but you can adjust materials and how they're put together uh, to still produce the same rigidity, the same uh, safety cell for the driver, uh, but uh, more so on a budget. And, of course, there are certain bits of these cars that are designed to snap off, to crumple, so as to protect the inner sanctum of uh, the more delicate area of the car. So, yeah, you know, if, if a car goes in nose first into a barrier, then that will do an awful lot of damage to the headlights, to the front splitter and uh, any area over the wheel arch. But then you can just take that bit off because it uh, unclips and put a new bit on. It's much more difficult to do that with the rear of a car uh, because you've got drivetrain there. You've got the extract gearbox. Is it extract gearbox? It is cars? extract. Yeah. Yep. And, then, and then where the Nissan engine sits as well. It's... I think fairly high up in these cars, that engine, though, compared to where it is positioned in an LMP2 car. Bit of a reminder there. 20% off the LMS shop for all the goodies, and uh, we're hoping to welcome everybody back to racing next year. First time we've had fans back since the pandemic, and uh, I think we're going to see through the afternoon here and certainly into tomorrow if the weather holds. Uh, but... A lot of people from the locale and a little further afield. Free entry here to Spa Francorchamps. And uh, Rocky World will be there and ready to take their details for a, a range of VLMS goodies. If you're joining us late in the session, you're wondering why this United Autosports team member. There it is. It's magnificent. I Walt, mean, Walt Disney. You know, I think it's great, actually. There's, there's somewhere to focus family attention here. You know, a bit of mild uh, uh, Mickey taking here, but um, I, I actually think it's fantastic. As someone who has brought both of his children in past years to race meetings, sometimes uh, the circuits and the championships don't do a great job of helping families to keep kids engaged. That is a sad, sad sight for the number 12 team. Uh, so just about to say, if you're wondering why uh, there's no on-track action, that's why. Yeah. Uh, the number 12 car uh, heavily into the tire barriers at Radion. Uh, and at the same time, it looks like a separate incident with the number 5 and V2S car coming to a halt at the bottom of a Rouge, which is before a Rouge. So information about the uh, restart will be given at 13.45. That's in about six minutes' time. As you can see, repairs are underway. I think they're going to replace... A whole stack or several stacks of tyres that have taken that first impact, Johnny. 
So there will be some concern about the state of the tyres by the look of it, yeah, which well, is an indication of the heaviness of the impact. Unfortunately, you don't get small incidents at um, Radion Corner, uh, as we've learnt through the years. Um, by the way, you don't have to be on site to take advantage of that 20% offer in the ELMS shop. If you head to boutique.lemon.org, uh, there's uh, fairly obvious ways to, to then click into the shop from there and uh, take advantage of the offers. So boutique.lemon.org. Obviously, if you're here, if maybe not watching us on TV, in fairness, and just enjoying the cars and the sounds, minus the commentary from me, from uh, me and Graham, which is possibly not a bad thing. Uh, but if you're witnessing this race from anywhere else around the world via our streams, uh, the website is there to get Le Mans caps, t-shirts, even little models of rookie. I don't think they do a model rookie land, but you can at yet. least get yet. yet. That's true. I mean, Are you plans, listening, Leko? The, the plans will be being drawn up as we speak. Spend over €5,000 and Johnny will deliver your order personally. <laughs> I'll build it out of bricks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. But, um, so, yeah, th th there's the opportunity because, of course, we've only got two more races to go for the ELMS, although an exciting new calendar announced Indeed. yesterday. And this might be a good chance to talk about that because although they're not strictly new circuits, if you go back long enough, we have visited both before. Yep. But it's nearly 10 years since we've been to Hungary, Graham. Uh, 2013, a uh, one-off for the European Le Mans series at the Hungara Ring. 2010, we had an extraordinary race for the Le Mans series, the first time ever that we'd seen LMP2 cars beat the LMP1 uh, opposition. I think the five high-quality LMP1 cars there that, that, uh, that evening. It was there, night into dark, uh, race into darkness, track of racing it was that uh, did the business there. But, uh, yep, we're back at the Hungar Ring for the first time since 2013. That will be a race in July. And the other uh, returning circuit will be Imola that replaces Monza on the calendar. And I'm particularly pleased with that one, Johnny, because there's an excellent gelateria just down the road. There is. I can picture it now. Yep. Although Monza was never really short on that, uh, the uh, opportunity to do similar, to be honest. But uh, it's always good to have at least one Italian circuit on the calendar. You can't really run a motorsport series without that. Uh, and nice that we don't, we're not necessarily kind of camping at one particular track for 10, 15 years. You know, it's refreshing to, to bring new tracks in. Um, and that means we won't go to... Is it Red Bull Ring that we've lost? Red Bull Ring, I'm afraid, steps away okay. uh, well, from the calendar for the time being, at least. Nice so to return to there this year. It was. But I do think it's important to just keep refreshing the calendar to, to keep interest as well. Um, and, uh, you know, they're all still grade one circuits. I had an excellent Crucially. conversation this morning with, with, uh, with Pierre Fiont, the uh, president of the ACO. And we're going to see just the aftermath of that. That didn't show us just how it happened. It showed us the aftermath. But that was a huge hit. Uh, you can see those bollards, that those uh, black cylinders that are bouncing around between uh, behind the car. They were holding those tyre stacks together. They've popped out under the pressure of that hit. OK. So it's a big hit for, for that part of the barrier and a big hit for number 12 car. For, was it David Hauser? Mm. So hopefully David OK after that as they lift out the damaged tyre stacks to be replaced. But the, yes, the impact point is further down the road than I would have expected. Yeah. So uh, the spin has obviously uh, meant that the, the car is facing then backwards, but roughly still going in a straight line until the point where everyone else is turning slightly left at Radion to then take the right-hand kink onto the Kemmel straight. And when David Hauser is a passenger, the car then just connects with the nearest bit of tyre wall, which is much further down the road. Still, the tyre stacks are very, very deep, deliberately to cushion the blow as much as possible. But you've got to make sure that the tyre wall is safe again to be hit once more. We really don't want that to happen, of course, throughout the rest of the weekend. Uh, but uh, structural integrity of tyre walls is so, so Indeed. important. Matthew Lahey there, and there's, I'm sure, will be jangling amongst the LMP2 runners. They're waiting to find out when the LMP3 session will be completed. 13.45, we're told there'll be more... Uh, information we can see why uh, right now there is the damaged area of tire stack there's another area of st uh, uh, stacks there in front of the Manitou that will be replacing them in the uh, safety precautions up at Radion more information at 155 now it's another so 10 minutes been pushed back by another 10 and we had a situation a little bit like this a few years ago, I seem to remember. That was a car spreading some fluid onto the Kemmel Strait, which took a while to mop up. 
Um, WEC qualifying uh, oh, started grief. like this, didn't uh, it? With it, a couple it, of Porsches going in. It didn't in. just start like this. It, it carried on like this and for quite some time. It was it was almost like an, uh, an action replay, but uh, another and another and another car. And that was uh, down to very cold temperatures in May, wasn't it, early in the year? Was. And getting tyre temp into the window. We haven't got that problem today because it's a nice, warm, toasty summer's afternoon in September. What we think we can do while we're in hold is if you are watching, uh, as I'm sure you are, otherwise there'd be pointless me talking to you. Uh, but if you have access to Twitter, pop in a question for us at hashtag AskELMS and you can copy in at Blackpool Johnny uh, for Johnny Palmer, at DSC Editor for myself. And if there's anything you want to know about uh, the ins, outs, what's, why's and wherefores of the European Le Mans series, or for that matter, the Michelin Le Mans Cup, we'll do what we can to answer those questions while we're just in hold here. Uh, as rapid work goes on to disassemble that tyre barrier and uh, we'll, we'll be able to give you some kind of indication as to when things are in a more positive vein when that uh, replacement stack of tyres starts to make its way to a vertical position yes. rather than horizontally as at the moment but uh, if you do uh, want to just have a chat with us electronically at least we'll do our best to help you good ide uh, idea by the way of the, the rise and fall of this circuit look in the background there um, beyond the grandstand the, uh, the track coming down towards uh, Rouge, then rising up, and it is, uh, you I'm sure have walked up. I uh, have. It is a very steep hill, yeah. indeed. I was trying to explain to someone yesterday just exactly what kind of topography we've got here at Spa, and the first time you go up to above Speaker's Corner uh, and look down and think, what's that building down there? That looks, oh, it's the pits. And it, 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 you feel like you're on the top of a mountain. Yes. It is an astonishing uh, realisation of what television does a great job of not accentuating, which is the sheer rise and fall. Sam Cox there from Algar Pro Racing, and the hardest working ladies in motorsports. And uh, Lawrence Hurt is uh, just having a chat there with one of the crew members as he waits to get back into action. And Loris Hoa could be, well, one tip for, of many for pole position, I'm sure, as uh, the marshal's mascot is strung from the fence there. Uh, more tyres, or the new set of tyres, close to going in here, but they've just got to make sure that the space is allowed for them and those additional uh, segments that go into the middle of the tyres to increase their rigidity will also have to be snapped back into place as well. The other, th the other thing that struck me when I walked the track a couple of years ago is how it folds back uh, uh, alongside the next bit. So actually oh, when, yeah. you, when you get to Le Combe and then turn right and start to head down to Bruxelles, if you actually go to the edge of the track and look down, you can see Speaker's Corner there yeah. and it's, I mean, you don't get that impression from the cameras. The parts of it are very, but, very compact. It's yes. an incredible use of space here. Again, you can see that uh, that, that what I'm talking about there is you look at the uh, the red and yellow at the back of the screen that's the exit turn one and it goes all the way down and then all the way back up again to get this helicopter shot of the spectacular scenery in the Ardennes around this region and uh, you do get the chance to come here for a racing weekend add on a day or two Go and have some frites and mayo. Treat <laughs> yourself. Yes. Um, there's some excellent places around here to go and look at, both scenically and historically, an amazing part of the world uh, here at Spa Francorchamps. And also a chance to drive the old circuit to the Master Kink and all that, because uh, that's still open as, it a, is. As, a, as a public road. <laughs> and uh, going down there at 70 kph, I think, how on earth did they arrive here at north of 200 k's? Crazy yeah. in the old days. Uh, Nielsen Racing having fun at one of the guys' expense. It's Tony Wells standing in the background there, giving us a wave from the number seven car. And uh, yeah, we're going to stick with that whilst it's still embarrassing for you. There's Tony. Uh, Already done some qualifying today. Not in the Nielsen car for this session, though. And, uh, but Nielsen Racing, work to do after a couple of stellar seasons have not really been on form this season but looking to bounce back if they possibly can. Yeah, um, 12th and 13th in the table from a championship perspective with 12 and a half points for their seven car and 10 for the number six car. It is a different story in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. Oh, very though. much so, yeah. Um, and, you know, this is their season to win that, I would say, with a race later today, in fact. So 
the, the problem with this is that you know we're delaying now the lunch break for the drivers particularly those drivers that are on double duty in both ELMS and Le Mans Cup with uh, the race scheduled to start later at five to four I suppose there's always the, the space for that to be pushed later on in the day with a, a slightly more relaxed curfew on a Saturday evening here at Spa and the track officials the track uh, staff are well used to repairing tyre wall not only at Radion but other places too so are particularly good at it yeah. in terms of uh, doing it at speed so we're about five minutes away from another update I have a sense that that's going to be pushed back a bit further though they're making progress that's Definitely. certainly the case um, well, that gentleman's going to be waiting there with his camera a little longer I think but uh, great to see you back sir and everybody who's with you it is an absolute delight to have fans back at the circuits. It's never a good sign, is it? It's so bad you feel like you need to cover it up. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a sorry sight, the number 12 racing experience car with all the damage, mainly in that rear left corner, although the parts of the rear right didn't look that great either. I think it's gone into the tyre wall and potentially bounced then around before being spat out a bit further towards the track thankfully it wasn't a big enough hit to the to return it to the racing part of the circuit and then for others to, to try and avoid it uh, the tyre wall did a good job in slowing the speed of the car but not then projecting it back Indeed. into the line of sight so graph racing here with their lmp three cars or lmp2 car i know they're hoping will return for portim out not present here this weekend for the european le mans series the 39 yeah so that's been run in the past by uh, max and arnold robin hasn't it with vincent capillaire correct the three uh drivers clearly their program with the team finished at the le mans 24 hours the yes. local race so that's a shame actually not to have the 39 car here because it's been a race winner not with that driver lineup but yeah. uh, with james allen uh, richard bradley was indeed in the in the lineup that year um so 39 a miss but the plan is to try and get it out for portugal that's certainly the idea and uh, numbers of teams scrambling at the moment uh, the uh, ultimate team with uh, francois rio a key part of that squad injured broken collarbone after a cycling accident pre le mans that cost him his Le Mans starts. Uh, he will not be fit, we understand, for Portimao. So the team are looking for a replacement bronze driver. So if you are bronze ranked, talented, and have access to a bank account with something in it, give them a call. I might know a few people. Yep. Uh, so the other two graph cars, though, are here very oh, yeah. definitely and very the much eight so. car is a much better place than the nine machine seventh place with a best result of third at red bull ring um finishing behind now who won that race our oh, cool racing won from the euro international mm -hmm. car um so Euro international are here with joey alders doing the qualifying in that uh, former championship winning indeed car, and another in team that's just you know from towering heights yes. just has not put it together this year it's you know there we are with the your international squad is that antonio ferrari on the right hand side it might be deep in conversation with team number okay that's yeah. not, not not a driver no no i realized that but i just wonder whether it was with another team it was actually velour because so that will be the aim one or well, the one aim rather with their team Damiano Fioravanti staying in the car I would have thought 1400 now is when we'll hear about this so with apologies for the extended delay I mean there will have been a discussion I'm sure with the drivers that were put into the cars for qualifying duty because it's it's now a warm afternoon do you get them out of the car and out of that claustrophobic environment uh, just to put them back in on a short call or is it just doors open refresh the drink bottles and just stay chatting to um, drivers because you know they want to kind of keep them in the zone keep the concentration levels there but at the same time I mean it's a little bit like not to the anywhere near the same degree but the, the Grand Prix that was held here a few or rather wasn't held here a few yep. weeks ago technically you know, was it, yes it was it was a two-lap uh, safety car event technically but, and controversially was 
you had drivers sort of walking around the paddock going, what do I do? Do I go away and have a, a snooze? Because we know it's not going to be another half, it's not going to start for another half an hour. And I remember Daniel uh, Ricciardo saying, I don't want to do that because it will get me out of the concentration zone. I just want to kind of stay bubbling without being fully eyes on stalks, but just raring to go. And it's interesting, you know, there's a few brollies out just to shelter the drivers from the heat of the day. Um, but most are choosing to stay in the office. The first here for Uge de Vilde, of course, uh, something of a local hero, doing uh, flying high in the championship. Here we go, Belgian driver. Might be probably about the second or third time he's ever seen sunshine here at Spa. Uh, certainly would be the same for a lot of us. Uh, we have had some spectacularly warm races here and some spectacularly cold and wet races. Uh, but it doesn't look as if we're going to be troubled by anything other than fine weather certainly today Johnny have you dealt with Joe's question yet by the way on Twitter oh, regarding I've seen the that. 41 car do you think if the 41 wins ELMS this year they will enter the WEC next year well I mean the, this is the WRT squad that uh, they are here by the way uh, as a championship entrance for the first time WRT have raced here in an MP2 before back in 2016 the final year of the previous formula before the Gibson engine cars but uh, of course here now with a single car entry in both WEC and in ELMS it's part of the both a sighting campaign and of course a statement of intent from WRT ahead of Hypercar LMDH in 2023 they're clearly aiming to catch the eye of Alan McNish and everybody at Audi for the factory contract there. Might we see a two-car entry for WRT and WC next year? It's possible. It's possible. Uh, there are all sorts of other possibilities. One of the ones we know already uh, that have committed to uh, a WC entry uh, involves a squad that are already here, the Ironlink squad with Prima Power Team. So Prima uh, will enter the WC next year with an LMP2 effort with at least one car and beginning to hear about another potentially spectacular entry into the WC uh, next year in the LMP2 class as another super team uh, starts to ramp up, let's say, ahead of their World Endurance Championship ambitions in 2023. More news on that, we hope, in the next couple of days. So L uh, LMP2 in this interim period as we, as we ramp up the hypercar class for WC is going to get very exciting indeed with some real serious players already heard from United Autosports they're looking to double up in to a two car team right. uh, next season uh, so that's looking good hearing some positive things about the current LMS teams and others looking at LMP2 here in Europe in Asia LMP3 with some new talents looking to come forward as well so choose your news pages I'd obviously prefer you choose dailysportscar.com for that uh, but the, choose your news pages and keep an eye on what's going on in sports car racing it is a fascinating time right now as teams manufacturers and drivers position themselves and that's our home this weekend I was say, yeah. we're in the back of that truck there the, Johnny the, the truck with the red square and the red triangle if you go to see through that wall You'd see me and Graham reclining. He's reclining. In our air-conditioned booth. Splendour. It's wonderful. If I need someone to bring his lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a hint? <laughs> it would be nice. Yeah, but well... The, it, the, I, I cannot remember in the near 20 years that I've been working in this industry a more exciting time at the top end of sports car racing and the best part about it is in order for people to prep to be there or to if you like feel as if they've earned their right to be there they're getting involved in this championship and in the WEC and the Asia Le Mans series and elsewhere to show what they've got and that means we've got a lot of surprises to come uh, this year into next year and into the year following that. What I will say on WRT is that I think it was very much deliberate to enter as many championships as they could, i.e. both ELMS and the World Endurance Championship, because they go to different tracks and you're getting so much more data on different circuits, different climates, um, and you know they've split their strategy, to use a sports car term. I'm sure the target is eventually to get both cars in the WEC uh, and also with all the, the Audi stuff to come to be in the box seat to take advantage of that uh, and also to, to audition some drivers. Well, well some of it will be budget related. It is clearly much cheaper to run uh, drivers who are paying 
uh, very many of them, and the European Le Mans series than the FI World Endurance Championship. But there are economies of scale. If you've got two cars rather than one, then running each of those cars is cheaper than if you were running it as a single car entry by about 10%. And that saving, to give you an idea, is a middle-ranking six-figure sum, the saving. It is a very expensive sport indeed at this kind of level. So there's all sorts of things that are in the mix, and a lot of that is going to depend on where are they in terms of their understanding of what happens to 2023, where are they in terms of driver interest and bringing some of that budget that teams require um, to get to 2023 and for that matter where are we going to race we now know where the WC is going to race we know uh, where the LMS is going to be racing and what I'm hearing is lots of those conversations are happening right now some of them right here and now in the in this paddock five past two we're going to get some more information about the restart time for this session still eight minutes and 32 seconds left on the clock miggins motorsport says uh, what are the chances of seeing some morris smith merchandise in the near future i am assuming you're thinking about a stick on silver beard i think a mo smith action figure would be something to <laughs> behold <laughs> I have to say, Mo, when he's wearing his COVID mask, is really entertaining because it doesn't hold the beard back at all. So it's sort of, sort of spurting out all sides there. Uh, but he's uh, such a such an enthusiastic guy. Um, French and American dual nationality, I think. I think that might be right. He's, 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 he's a certainly fluent in French, but he's fr from the US originally, I think. Um, Absolutely. But uh, um, a mean racer with Matt Bell. And you mean that in the nicest way? Yeah, not, not well, me. Yeah, most, most complimentary way, yes. Uh, thoroughly nice guy off the track, but does all his talking on it. And um, that's the reason why they are pretty close to the top of the championship currently in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. Session is going to resume on a short call. We're not going to wait till the next uh, update. As you can see, work is beginning to be completed there. There's two friends who've fallen out, can only actually text each other nowadays. That's very sad to see. A couple of quick questions, because you've been good enough to... Uh, to um, Pop them in on Twitter. Uh, we'll come to a couple of questions about what we think about Radion in a moment. Uh, there was one here that I've just lost again, which was asking about the last time we had a non-European driver win a race in the LMS. That comes from Lachlan at Babs wants kebabs uh, on Twitter. I think we've had three this year. Uh, James Allen won last time out. Uh, he's Australian. He won at Monza. Before that, Franco Colapinto at the Castellet, an Argentinian driver, and Yife Ye at the Red Bull Ring. Um, in fact, winning the first two. So here's the, the odd one there, Lachlan. We've actually had a non-European driver win every single race this season so far. And it'd be interesting to see whether or not that might continue. Cars getting to the end of pit lane. So happily, it looks like we're about to get uh, back underway. Racestaff.com, race uh, underscore staff on Twitter, says which bar in Spa has the best beer? All of them. I think is the answer yeah. and we'll be doing some extensive research on that at some point in the very near future has to be done it has been it's a filthy filthy job Th now, th that's what the caption isn't it uh, Manitou race uh, the wrong way around Spa with added tyres has got to be a thing in the future there's rallycross happening here these days of course two rallycross meetings a year I understand now and uh, th I have to say that the organisers of the ELMS have done a splendid job in making sure that sign on this weekend was at the very top of the highest grandstand you could wish to encounter which overlooks the rallycross track I have never experienced a, a view of Eau Rouge quite like that we are about to open pit exit we are about to open pit exit so, so I loved signing on yesterday and absolutely. Just, I, I had to spend another 15 minutes just watching the cars it's through the sky, the sky lounge it's called I can see why absolutely as we're waiting for this to get back underway we've got a couple of pit questions. exit is green pit exit is go, green which is great as the cars will be on there establishing lap couple of questions one from Jakob one from safe Phil what do we think about potential changes to uh, Radion that's perfectly pertinent right now there are questions to be asked there's no doubt about that I know a lot of brains bigger than mine and with more qualification and the physics involved here are putting a lot of thought into what can and maybe should be done about uh, crash protection at Radion it's one of the reasons if you talk to some of the sensible brains around this why track limits are so very important yes we've seen other racing where frankly uh, teams and drivers get away with things that they really shouldn't and that means that when the inevitable does happen they are huge huge accidents and uh, Thankfully, we have a race director here that does take these things very seriously and makes it very clear what's expected from the guys and the girls uh, in the European Le Mans Series. Quick, quick wave from the DK Engineering. 
uh, cockpit either to us or to the marshals or to both either way good afternoon Lawrence sir what do I think should happen I think they should look at it I think they should look at the physics of it I think we should look at what solutions are available to it and I think you know little doubt in my mind we're seeing too many serious accidents with cars that are only going quicker Yes, yes, but the, uh, the opposite end of the, the spectrum of the argument, you've got to think about over sanitising a race I circuit. I absolutely do which, not want to lose that corner. We, well, exactly, because it, it is iconic when it comes to Spa. It's iconic around the world when you compare it to so many other racetracks. People come to Spa to experience Eau Rouge and Radion, and there are very different accidents that have taken place there Indeed. this year alone. You know, think about the ML Fry Lamborghini problem, which was a, a car going into the driver's left at the kink there at Radion, and then uh, others connecting. Yep. And then there's the, the, the more classic Radion incident, which goes through the corner and you end up in the tie wall on the outside, which yep. is what happened to David Hauser. How do you stop both of those? Sometimes things happen much for earlier out of Eau The W Series qualifying incident was more of a, I think, liquid down on the circuit, which took cars uh, too deep into the corner mm -hmm. and up into the barrier on driver's left. It's very easy. There's not to, a single answer, is there? You're lumping no, Eau Rouge isn't. and Radion and a steep hill and you know a, a fully committed corner all into one pot. I don't think you find one solution. No, I think the answer ultimately is it requires investigation. Mm. Uh, do I trust the people involved in doing this? I 100% do. I'm happy to be of a generation of more elderly people that have not lost dozens of my heroes Huge. to you know to an accident and a lot of that is because of the safety that's been built in to the cars and to the circuits so you know before we all of us become internet experts and i'm someone who lives on the internet um let's trust the guys who've made those massive massive strides in the past decades to make even further strides as we step forward and as you quite rightly say johnny we don't want to lose the uniqueness of these circuits we mm. don't want it sanitized and neither do the drivers nick de vries that was uh, in the g drive racing team as we watch one of the nielsen cars that's a great car scrolling through under power and five minutes and 22 seconds remain of this race as the first of the runners start what we hope will be their first flying laps. Yes, because still there are no times posted by any of the 16 cars. Remember, David Hauser and Racing Experience will take no further part today, quite possibly tomorrow as well. Fabian Leverne, who didn't cause the red flag, but his car stopped on the run down towards Eau Rouge as, uh, during the same uh, time period of the racing experience accident, and his car had to be craned away back to the paddock, so they'll be trying to fix that for MV2S Racing, but that car will start at the back of the LMP3 pack on tomorrow's grid, assuming they are able to fix it. As then down in towards Campus Corner in the end of the second sector goes the Nielsen car driven by Max Cobalt, and uh, calls that as the eight. Apologies, it's of course the six. It's six and seven this year for Nielsen Racing. Yes, uh, the eight car David Drew for Graf and Matthias Kaiser in the sister car for Graf. But it's Cobalt who is safely through the uh, second sector, running up towards the right and the left at the end of the lap. The bus stop chicane turns 18 and 19, and Cobalt was about to set a time there. So that will be our first flying lap for Max Kerbolt, and so inevitably we'll go to the top. 2.13.997 is the time to beat. It's beaten immediately by David Drew by 1.1 seconds. A good time there from Drew, a 2.12.843. Jerry Alders pops through into second uh, place, second spot at the moment. Colin Noble to third, and we're already losing laps. Jerry Alders goes to the top, so we've already lost uh, David Drew's lap lost through track limits. Yeah. And so Alders from Noble from Cobalt at the moment, they at the times that stand with Matthias Kaiser coming through and setting fourth quickest time. Colin Noble, Damiano Fiorenti, apparent, uh, uh, sorry, uh, into third with the one aim for Lorba Corsica. So that's the second lap for David Drew that has been deleted. He had one taken away just before the red flag as well, lap three. Uh, so most of the front runners have now posted four laps with Nicholas Pino in the Inter-Europol competition car. Laurence Hoare to the top of the times, car number four, by 64 thousandths of a second. It's a 2.12.517. From Wayne Boyd, who'd popped in with that uh, that time, just shy of Laurence Hoare's uh, effort. Hugo de Vilde uh, is now third, so it's all changed at the top. Hoare from Boyd, de Vilde, Alders, Garrett Grist into fifth. Malta Jakobsen up into third now. He loses that lap time. 
So De Vilde back to third, Joey Alders fourth, Garrett Grist is in fifth position ahead of Duncan Tappy, and uh, Demiano Fioravanti's got speed, Malte Jakobsen likewise, but again they need to keep it between the white lines. This might be a similar problem that we had in the GTE running. Hold your breath for a moment or two, or take a breath rather, because now all of the cars are either in sector one or sector two, and Max Cobalt will start off the next bout of potential fast times. But uh, time really slipping through everyone's fingers here. Two minutes left on the clock. I reckon some of these cars, or will they all make it to the end of the lap? Yeah, they should do. They'll all make it to the end of this lap and have one more to go. Yeah. And uh, the times are all improving. Yes. Everybody everybody that's setting times at the moment is blue at least in sector one with the exception of Lawrence Hurt who's gone purple so he's on an absolute flyer Joey Alders comes through to complete what will be his second flying lap in the number 11 car sits fifth at the moment in fact fourth now at the moment what's he do and come through with it is an improvement in time fourth uh, so Hoa, Boyd, De Vilda, then Joey Alders in the number 11 car, waiting for the 18 of Damiano Fioravanti to cross the line any moment now. And I think Fioravanti is capable of a top five time. Let's see whether the Italian moves. He moves a couple of places to sixth spot for the one aim Villorba Corsa car. Laurence Hoa surely about to improve again. He's done two purples already. Oh. It's a 2.11, Boyd 5.80 to give him virtually a full second on every Else. It's an actual full second and the thousandth, 1.001 it is, whilst we wait for no, well it is an improvement in time but it only shaves two tenths uh, out of that second's advantage, it's Wayne Boyd, uh, it cements his second place but he's eight tenths off with Hugo de Vilda coming through, another improvement, uh, but he goes through to second, seven tenths off, goes second ahead of Wayne Boyd, Garrett Grist improves to third and Malta Jakobsen if he keeps this lap, He's gone through in fourth position after losing that uh, first flying lap to a track limits infringement. The top four within a single second. Her, De Vilda, Boyd, Jakobsen, then Garrett Grist, 1.2 seconds back. Joe Elders, 1.5. Duncan Tappy, 1.7. And nobody's going to make the line in the next 10 seconds, which is the time allowed on the clock now, because uh, Max Cobalt just starting the final sector at Curve Paul Frere as I speak. So everybody else will have the remainder of this lap with right in the middle of uh, the batch of cars, Laurence Hoare. So he's got potentially faster cars behind him, likewise in front as well. But the thing is, he's... 0.7 of a second faster than all the others that have offered time so far. Hugo de Vilde second, Wayne Boyd third, Malta Jakobsen fourth, and there is the chequered flag, Graham, but those that have started this lap can finish it. Indeed, and Lance Hur already purple in sector one on this lap as well. He's not going to wait to see if anybody can challenge. David Drew comes through, takes the flag, takes fourth, goes ahead of Malta Jakobsen, also finishing this session. Uh, Matthias Kaiser, Max Korpolt, and Joey Alders, he'll do no better than seventh. Others are improving around here, Garrett Grist on a quick one, uh, Colin Noble pits the number seven car from ninth place on this grid, it's no improvement for Lawrence Herbert, he doesn't need it at the moment in sector two, time obviously has expired, it's about getting the cars across the line now. Fioravanti up one space, so that moves him ahead of Colin Noble, is it going to be another improvement? Yes it is, it's a 2.11.548 this time for Lawrence Hall, 0.744 of a second over Hugo De Vilde, who's still behind the German driver, so what can the Belgian do? He must know this place intimately, uh, but he's not up on this uh, this final lap. Wayne Boyd improves but does not improve position, closes in to just a few hundredths off Hugo De Vilde, who looks at the moment, unless uh, Unless Malta Jakobsen, who doesn't look to be improving right now, uh, can challenge. Garrett Grist is on quite a quick one, but not one that's going to challenge pole position. He opts to actually pit the car. Malta Jakobsen crosses the line, makes no improvement. It's Lawrence Herr from Uga de Vilda. There. They are the top two in LMP3 from Wayne Boyd and David Drew on the second row. Malta Jakobsen and Garrett Grist on row three after well, what ended up being a very short session indeed because of that red flag. Uh, interruption Johnny and uh, 211548 that's some lap from the Dicar Engineering star 
Laurence Hoare, four pole positions in a row now for 2021. Red Bull Ring, Paul Ricard, Circuit Paul Ricard, Monza and now spa Francorchamps. The time he set mightily impressive in the two 11s. Further down the table, Euro International, seventh on the grid ahead of United Autosports. But the story is all about Laurence Hoare. Here's the top three then. Wayne Boyd, the Ulsterman, sharing the number two car with Rob Weldon uh, at United Autosports and Edward Coop. Uh, Uga de Vilde with Martin Hipper in the number 13 car and a new teammate Aidan Reed this weekend, the silver rated Aussie. But it is Laurence Hoare who shares with Mathieu de Barbois uh, as just a twosome, the four car uh, as the bronze rated driver de Barbois and uh, a little bit of porpoising heading through Eau Rouge and Radion. That's where the aerodynamics of these cars really come into their own. Already we are into LMP2 qualifying. This shows you how far behind schedule we are. I wonder whether Eduardo opened the pit lane as LMP3s were still streaming into it. I think he probably did. Uh, <laughs> let's tell you who's out there. Phil Hansen will be aboard the number 22 United Auto Sports car. He'd export the Patrick Pile, ex-Porsche factory driver, of course. Mathieu LaHaye is in the 29 car, running in LMP2. P2, not Pro-Am this weekend, just the LeHay brothers this weekend. Rene Bender in the 30 Duquesne team car. Nico Jaman in the United Autosports 32. Harry Tickner uh, aboard Racing Team Turkey's Pro-Am effort in the 34 car. Sergio Campana in the BHK Motorsport car 35. Charles Malaisi, uh, Le Mans winner in LMP2, joins Cool Racing this weekend in their Pro-Am 37 car. Louis Delatraz, uh, the unfortunate squad in the 41 Team WRT car looking to get their season back on track here in the ELMS this weekend. 65 uh, Panis Racing car that won last time out. James Allen takes the track there. It's Ferdy Habsburg in the 24 car for Algar Pro Racing. And we wait to see who's going to be coming out in the 25 and 26 G-Drive racing cars. Tellingly, on our tracker, we've got uh, this uh, block of just little squares with question marks going around. That's the LMP3s that aren't recognised in this session. So we actually had LMP3s just into the final sector as the LMP2 session became live. Absolutely. Well, they're mixed together in the race, so uh, what's the problem with having them out at the same time on the track in the qualifying sessions? They didn't meet one another because the final LMP3 car is already in the pit lane before the first of the P2s heads across the line. Big pit, uh, puff of smoke there it at last source, but not from the WRT car. Uh, so it might have been from car 28, in fact, which is the Edex Sport Patrick th Pile driven machine. I think it most certainly was. That was Beautifully judged, by the way, by race control. Well done, ladies and gentlemen, there. And uh, claws back a bit, that time lost. A little bit, yes. I mean, it's due to be five minutes, I think, between the two sessions. Uh, so five, six, maybe seven minutes gained back again. Oh, but another monster incident at Radion Corner, and it's the 32 United Order Sports car that causes an immediate red flag. That is Nicola Jamin, who for me was starting as one of the favourites to be quickest in this session. He topped, I think, a free practice session earlier this weekend, but that car has gone into the tyre wall at a rapid rate of knots, destroyed the front and the rear of that LMP2 car, and quite understandably and unsurprisingly, we go red flag. Flags once again, Graham Goodwin. It immediately a red flag for a big hit indeed. Second one, I'm afraid. And uh, hold our breaths here. And that is Nico Jaman climbing out the car, and I couldn't be more relieved. That was a huge shunt. He's uh, furious, well, I think with himself, but manages to walk away, and he's lost it through the turn, and that's one, two big hits all down the left-hand side of the car. Wheels staying actually on the machine. The wheel tethers there. The tethers doing their job incredibly well, but all of the bodywork around the tyres completely destroyed. You can't even recognise that as an LMP2 car from the left side. And that's the first thing Nico, Nico did as he got out of the car just venting with frustration because of his own error. There wasn't a car in front or behind. He maybe was going to argue that the track wasn't sufficiently swept, but I have to say, I mean, they were there for a long, long time yeah, clearing uh, things up, and yeah. actually there shouldn't have been anything on the track surface where he was losing it. So that's just a bit too much eagerness, maybe because having to wait a little bit longer to take part in the session, and, you you know, tyre temperature, although on a warm day, just qu wasn't quite there, perhaps. He's terribly frustrated you can see the adrenaline is very 
There's gushing there, and that'll be shock. Uh, I'm sure some relief as well at United Autosports. There was a there was a sight I caught. Let's just uh, witness the incident again. I mean, unabated speed into exactly the same tyre wall area that they spent so long repairing. And now, folks, you see why the track staff took so long. Jop van Oert does not really know where to look. Well, the, the emotions there. Number one, it is shock when you see something like that happen and it's and it's your car and it's your teammates there will be i'm sure huge concern but he now has seen nico climb out of the car and punch just about everything that was in within uh, within range yeah. um and then frustration because that's that's huge that that is a huge amount of damage on that car particularly United Order Sports, attention to detail is second to none. And I remember, distinctly remember there was a shot of the 32 car with the chamois leather, just just sorting out the front yep. of the nose of the car because of the extended gap of the red flag in the LMP3s. And you think, look at it now. I mean, it was literally being polished 10 minutes ago. Absolutely. And it is just a pile of nuts and bolts and carbon fibre and uh, loose wheels now. And that car has got to be out of tomorrow's race. I, now. I'd be amazed if that is not a car that's had chassis damage from that, yeah. that from that hit. If, if it has, chapeau to everybody at Orica. Well, amazing, indeed. amazing cars. The technology involved now, particularly on the safety front, is staggering. But that's a huge, huge impact. Unabated speed was a perfect description, Johnny. Nine minutes and one second is a similar time to what we had still available to those in the LMP3. That was 8 and 32. I was looking at 8 minutes and 32 for a long time. I have a feeling the 901 will stick in the memory for a bit longer as well. Uh, but of course, I mean, the hard work that they were doing to repair the tyre wall the first time around, much of that's been done. And I don't know whether the tyre wall has been a, as badly damaged this time around with a lot of new kit going in there. Uh, it is designed to be hit more than once, but they will have to go down and check it, of course. There's a lot of shards of bodywork to be cleaned away as well. So I think this is easily going to be another 15 minutes and possibly slightly more. Sorry about this, folks. Yeah, absolutely. Let's keep an eye out and see what uh, we hear from race control. Um, their, their primary concern, of course, initially was Nico Jaman. He will be on his way to the medical centre for a check over as is always the case after an incident of that magnitude um, the secondary thing will be to make sure that we uh, we get this thing back underway we're going to be very shortly going down to pit lane yeah, uh, two United Order Sports because they are obviously the, the big story of the moment, having seen that frightening looking uh, incident for Nico Jaman. We still don't know about Nico's condition, so we shouldn't assume anything there, but at least let's catch up with one of his teammates now chatting to Haley. That's right, I'm joined here by Jobban out at um, co driver, sorry, co um, teammate of Nico Jaman, driver of car number 32. Now, can you just tell us, do you have any information regarding the crash that we just saw out there? Yeah, it basically you bought him out in a rouge and then the car just snapped on him. Uh, he, he said on the radio that the car bought him more than normal. Uh, how and why it bought him more than normal, we don't know. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a corner where you, we have to be flat in order to be to be fast like if we lift uh, you lose two three tens down the back straight so we, we yeah we, we have to take risk um, it's just a shame because for the mechanics it will be a lot of work uh, let's hope that it's fixable for tomorrow and that they have all the spare parts and, all, and a new car uh, because we probably need one so yeah, fingers crossed they can they can all fix it. Um, and Nico is okay. Like we've we've heard him on the radio, he's he's fine. So yeah, it's just a tough one to swallow right now. Yeah, right. Imagine it's not the best of big stroke of luck. Um, you said that hopefully it's uh, repairable. Do you have any information regarding the state of the car? Regarding the the state of the car. Yeah, well, the car is basically written off if uh, I, yeah I, we've had or not we there have been more crashes in Arouge I've had one as well a couple of years ago but after that the car is just written off and you need a you nine out of ten times you need a new chassis um, and then we just need to see how it is with the engine etc if we can still use that or not um, but yeah 
anyway, if one thing's for sure is that we will not be starting in front. Yeah, right. Um, so, Nico, it must be super frustrating for you, especially as Nico set the fastest time in free practice to today. I mean, it was yeah. all looked so good up until his first flying lap. It must be frustrating for you. Yeah, it's it's frustrating for me, but also for Nico, I guess, because he, you know, I'm, I'm great friends with him, and then you don't want to see your teammates standing, yeah, like this on the side of the track because it's a dangerous sport that we do, and yeah, we all we all hope that in the end everything always goes well. Uh, but it's things like today that shows that it is a tough sport, and it is hard, and it is dangerous, and you always need to, yeah, take care and. Uh, yeah, hopefully we can just have a clean race then tomorrow. Thank you very much, Rob. You're welcome. Well, still talking as if it's possible to race tomorrow, which, you know, you, you can't deny the fact that, uh, that there is hope there that the car can be, if anything, replaced, possibly repaired. But I, I suppose they may get, be able to get special dip dispensation if they can find a spare car. Um, but otherwise, that's that's almost certainly an all-nighter to get that ready for an 11 o'clock start tomorrow. And, of course, you've got to be on the grid before 11 o'clock. Taking into account what, uh, as we see, the, the work going on, it's, it's almost like an action replay of what we saw earlier, isn't it? It is, rather, um, yes. Take into account what uh, Job was able to tell us, that Nico told him on the radio the car he felt had bottomed out more than it normally would. That's the compression uh, out of Eau Rouge and up towards Radion, where the car compresses in that dip. Uh, and it could be whether or not he was running slightly t uh, tighter line, whether or not he got the the, um, the plank of the car underneath caught on that on that curb and that sent the car around. We didn't see the car in the turn. We saw what had happened after he'd lost control. And at that point, there's just no coming back from that. Uh, so either way, um, perfectly expressed, I thought there from Jovo uh both the concern for his teammate and his friend. Uh, was, was very happy to hear that he told him uh, on the radio at least that he felt absolutely fine. Doctors will, I'm sure, uh, make sure that the due checks are made after an impact of that magnitude. Uh, but beyond that, yes, the feelings about the, uh, the, the team effort, what's going to be required now to get this effort back on track, if, it's, if that's possible. And indeed, the kind of frustration that inevitably comes after all this preparation for it to go that wrong this early into a qualifying session. The margins for error are incredibly small, uh, particularly at that part of the circuit. And as Jop uh, made the point, if you're slow or at all in doubt through Eau Rouge and Radion, you're not going to get a good lap time. So you have to be fully committed and take with that the risks that inevitably come. So uh, United Order Sports, uh, at least with their 32 car, will have to keep waiting for a pole position this year. We have had only two cars on pole to this point. The 26 G drive that's done it on three separate occasions and uh, the unexpected one was from the Pro-Am category when Logan Sargent was guesting in the 34 racing team Turkey car and stuck it on pole in Austria he did. at Red Bull Ring. He did. Um, um, yeah. Good point. Uh, you know, we continue to get, by the way, a dribble of things coming through on the hashtag AskLMS uh, thread. Another one from Safe Phil who says, can we have a massive round of applause? The Orange Army rebuilt that wall in preparation for the 32 incident because it seems to have performed very well. Uh, 100%. It's an odd thing, isn't it? You would kind of think that uh, with the number of incidents you get up at Eau Rouge, Radion, that uh, it wouldn't be a favoured post for some of the marshals because <laughs> there's a hell of a work right there. I am privileged to know at least one marshal um, that uh, very often serves on that post as we get another chance to see the car going around and at least scrubbed off some speed with that spin, but a big, big hit in, as you said, Johnny, exactly the same position as was hit by the 12 car. I can tell you that the marshals on those posts, on the outside, on the inside, um, take huge pride in the fact that they are in one of the most dangerous parts of any race circuit that I'm aware of, mm. uh, at kind of class one internationally, and their work rate is absolutely spectacular. And time and time again, their preparation and re-preparation of the uh, crash protection that we have there, instant protection we have on both sides of the track, has made the difference between, well, you know, a very serious incident like we've just seen and one that could be a lot more serious. And absolutely, Phil, uh, join you and I'm sure everybody else who takes any kind of interest in motorsport and applauding their efforts. And applauding the efforts too, by the way, of race control under pressure to get this, this race meeting moving along to make sure that the priority is given to making sure that the very best job can be done in 
prepping that area for the almost inevitability that uh, the hard work is going to be undone at some point in the either near or medium term future. Uh, it is one of the most challenging corners in motorsport in the world. Guess what? Someone else has found that out. And particularly in a qualifying session, when you are trying to go through there as quickly as possible in a very light car, uh, and you know the, the, the behaviour of the car compared to how you've been driving it in free practice may be very, very different. How many kind of light runs have they done to this point? And you're throwing 25-year-old uh, Nicolas Jama, who is mightily experienced, gold-rated, he's former champion in US Formula Ford, and has uh, certainly done incredibly well for results-wise in ELMS with a variety of teams, Duquesne. Panis Racing now with United um, but still someone of, of such great experience and ability can still make these errors that are very small but then the butterfly effect sends them into just huge magnitude moments uh, that can destroy a car like that Yeah, watching the uh, ELMS pho uh, photographic contingents uh, this weekend not a great work rate going on there at the moment, so it's quite disappointing. And it gives me a moment, by the way, and I'll say it right now. Uh, my best wishes to one that's not with us this weekend, David Lord, at home, um, uh, with some sad news on the family front for Dave and his family. Dave, we are thinking of you. We really are, mate. Wish you were here and completely understand why you're not this weekend. Back to uh, the inaction at the moment on track, but a lot of action with that tyre wall. They've had the practice. Uh, they, they're doing this one a bit more quickly, I think. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, th th already got rid of the, the the tires. I don't think it quite was in the same place because they're painted tires. Yeah. So that so I think he's probably hit a little more towards pit out here, but it was marginal, wasn't it? They didn't paint the new set of tires that were going in the first time. That, did that they? would be a work rate. <laughs> quick drying paint as well absolutely but yeah i mean it's it's on the dog leg at the end of the tires isn't it so that that second stack if you like is always susceptible to getting the punishment because if a car loses it very late on in radion i mean you can forget about eau rouge there's nothing to do with that yeah. it's the run over the top of the hill radion corner and he lost it much later than i'm used to seeing cars spin and therefore caught the the, the tires at the second angle uh, as they return to meet the kink onto the kemmel straight but yeah i think you're right that the the foreshortening of the camera effect means that it is a very slightly different position yeah. Um, but, but it was slightly they're, different. They're, I mean, they're well versed in uh, exactly what has to be done. It, I mean, again, going back to uh, Haley's chat with Jopan Utet, perfectly explained as best we can without having seen it, that uh, Nico felt the car bottomed out more than it otherwise would have done. At that point, he's basically in a situation where he's not got the grip he otherwise would get. Why do they do it that way? He explained that perfectly too. Two to three tenths of a second to be gained there as, a, you know, the harder you can attack that corner. Yeah. And that's both the profit and the loss, isn't it? The profit is get it right and if nothing goes wrong, you launch yourself, you know, onto the Kemmel Straits, you know, at a higher speed, get it wrong and disaster looms uh, you know, just a few metres away in the you know, carrying arms of a tyre barrier. And mercifully on this occasion, uh, what we've got is a driver that has literally managed to walk away. Uh, he'll be sitting, I'm sure, still just as angry as he was with himself or whatever else uh, he feels is to blame for that uh, incident in the medical centre right now, with us having the happy knowledge that he's communicated to the team that he's feeling fine. Quick wave from John Fowle from behind the COVID mask. He'll be taking part in the, the, the event tomorrow in the 25 car as the bronze-rated driver. Gustavo Menezes, which is a change of driver, by the way. Roberto Mary, who'd been in that car all the way to, the, I think, all the season to this point, is replaced by the Californian. And Menezes, again, trying to retain the concentration, but also just trying to close his eyes for a moment or two to reserve energy as, or conserve energy for as much as possible and be ready to get going again once more on a short call. So a similar situation to the chosen LMP3 drivers earlier on. So yet again, I'm afraid, a pause in action while we get uh, repairs are completed up at Radion. Second significant shunt in these quick fire qualifying session the first in the lmp3 session for the race experience racing experience number 12 duquesne hands of david hauser uh, david seems to be absolutely fine car somewhat not 
Nico Jaman then uh, gave us a repeat performance almost as the LMP2 qualifying session got underway in the number 32 United Autosports Orica. Again, similar results. Significant damage, very significant damage to the Orica. Uh, Nico Jaman able to climb out of the car and walk under his own steam whilst extremely angry with whatever he'll tell us later, I'm sure, um, to the car that's taken him for his mandatory check at the medical centre, but uh, under his own steam and apparently OK. We are on pause whilst the tyre barrier is uh, reassembled for the second time in, what, half an hour? Uh, yeah. Or less than that, in fact. Uh, hashtag AskELMS on Twitter if you want to send your questions towards us. We've dealt with uh, a number of them already. Uh, right Turn Lover says, uh, the race tomorrow feels quite early in the day. Am I misremembering it normally being later? Or if not, why is it earlier this year? Well, actually, last year, in a weird old year when everything was rearranged, it was an 11 o'clock start. And I think that's been a conscious decision by ELMS to try and get it uh, a common start time uh, and actually as early in the day as possible, bearing in mind a lot of these guys are customers who have a day job that runs Monday to Friday and they want to get home. There's, there's, that, there's, there's two or three things about it. One is that common start time absolutely is welcome by absolutely everybody. Uh, the second part of it is... Uh, with the kind of COVID protocols that are in place, actually having more time to deal with that at the, the end of a weekend on a Sunday night makes perhaps. a massive, yeah. massive difference. And a long chat this morning uh, with a couple of the team coordinators, uh, together with uh, uh, Fred Lucia, the new CEO of LMEM, and with the uh, the president of the ACO, uh, Pierre Fion, about the kind of the uh, I like the exit strategy from COVID protocols and. Uh, we should say, by the way, we've got the uh, the two incidents being shown again here. And uh, uh, Pierre, who is racing this weekend, you've been commentating yep. on him, I think got a podium he did. this morning. That's right. For He'll race again later this afternoon. In JSP4 as part of the Ligia European Series, yes. But uh, the very aware of the impact financially, emotionally, uh, and in terms of the sheer exhaustion that's come with organising race meetings, planning around race meetings, the paperwork, the testing... Trust me, we wish many more of you were here at the track. It has not been an easy couple of years to be part of the industry of motorsports. Um, everything, everything is more difficult right now. And you're not misremembering, because I've checked back 2018 and 17. They were 12.30 starts. I think we've had a 12 o'clock as well. But remember 2018, when there was a weather system coming in and the, and the decision was made by the championship to move the start time uh, forwards, forwards in time, effectively, to a 10 o'clock or half 10 start That's right. to try and get the four hours in. Which we didn't. And we couldn't do it. Yep. We only got to 50% and half points awarded because it was a two-hour race in the end. Uh, won by United Order Sports, Phil Hansen and Philippe Albuquerque uh, in 2018. And that was the season before they started to do all their winning. Yeah, I mean, flexibility is very good, I yep. think, in this kind of instance. But, you know, what we've seen with other championships and Principally, I guess we've got to we've got to ignore talking about the Formula One race that never was here, but sort of was. Um, is because they're tied in by so many commercial constraints, it sort of stuffed them, didn't it? They, they didn't have any kind of flexibility around what was a known problem yep. on site for weather. We have seen uh, the ELMS able to 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 do better than that with the commercial constraints that they've actually got and, and more power to them. Mm. Maybe that's part of the lesson that needs to be learned as we enter, to be blunt, what feels like a new era for this planet. Yep. There are going to be a lot more of these to come where we've got these extreme weather conditions. Like it, loathe it, agree with me, disagree with it. I'm talking about the evidence of my own eyeballs as uh, the uh, braces go back into this tyre wall. Now, I think we're getting very close to the point where they'll get things back underway after a quick clear up here. The reality is, what is the biggest change that needs to be made? Well, in some cases, drainage, no doubt about that, and some fine work going on at a number of international circuits. The other big change that they're going to have to grip is flexibility. No doubt whatsoever, that's going to have to be part of the, um, the way in which international motorsport and other sports, for that matter, deal with the challenges that climate change is going to pose to us. And starting the race earlier in the day just gives you more options, uh, even just to push it on later. You know, if there's a delay in the morning. I mean, there shouldn't be because there's actually no races planned before tomorrow's big event. 
Uh, but if there have been delays earlier on in the weekend, if there's a poor weather system, then it gives you the, the uh, flexibility to move it even earlier in the day or later in the day if you plonk it right in the middle. Um, and, you know, from a European perspective, an 11 o'clock start is absolutely fine. Grand Prix start at, what, 2 o'clock with a 1 o'clock start in the UK. So there is a slight difference there, but it is a four-hour race rather than a 90-minute or two-hour affair as with a Grand Prix. Yep. Session will restart on a short call, Johnny. Yes, um, and the, with the braces being dropped in to position into the tyre stacks, just all, all that remains now to, to happen is that the, the track sweeper will step into action once more to deal with the shards of carbon fibre from the 32 car, but also bits of tyre and um, paint as well that have, been, have ended up on the racetrack. Uh, so once all that has been dealt with and the recovery vehicles are moved to a safe location, we will be ready to go. This what, what this has provided is an opportunity for Rookie Land to be explored. There are a lot more fans there uh, this time than when we checked in about an hour or so I ago. Our, I think our plug for it has, must, have, uh, must have worked. You know, absolutely. They've been streaming towards it. I, I, you know, we, we, we are mildly taking the mickey. It's great news that a championship has put investment into something of a family-focused show and I think that will pay them dividends. It's great that we've got either free entry, as we've got here, or very limited cost. And when we can eventually reopen the paddock, it won't be this year, I'm sure. And we're back to green. We are. So that was a very short call, and hopefully everyone was aware. Well, certainly Harry Tinknell was. He's the only car to be in the session at this stage. You've got to think there's not a lot of time to lose here. Eight and a half minutes. Take off the pole. <laughs> purely because he's the only car out there, but also he's a very quick driver, uh, doesn't need any more invitation to get behind the wheel and get going, because looking behind him, there's nobody else on the Kemble Strait. Make use of an empty racetrack when it is at your disposal. I think that surprised a number of the teams, I'll yeah, be honest with you. I, I think agree. they underestimated, or rather overestimated, the amount of time that uh, was going to be required to get things back to green flag running. And it uh, looks to me like... The Racing Team Turkey effort, which is run by TF Sport with some technical support, by the way, from Jota in this effort, have, uh, have rather got the march on, on uh, much of the field. And we've only got four cars back on track, and the clock is ticking down under eight minutes. Tinks is always switched on, raring to go, and the TF Sport banner at the top of the windscreen telling us uh, who is behind this effort for Racing Team Turkey, sharing with his teammate Sally Yolich and Charlie Eastwood, Turkish and Irish respectively. Uh, but Tinknell brought in as the platinum rated driver a little earlier on this season. Uh, Harry, come, coming from, uh, well, he's uh, been out racing, of course, in IMSA as a Mazda factory driver, but yes. since Le Mans start this year, cemented uh, his record as having started that race in all four, what current modern classes, if you classify LMP1 and hypercar as effectively the same sort of top class, started in GTM, with one in two of those four classes in LMP2, uh, with Jota back in the day, and he's coming straight back in. That's interesting. Isn't so it just? They're going to be doing a tyre switch, I would think, here. Uh, diagonally or left to right with the APR cars for G Drive Racing that is about to join the session 26 just ahead of 25 with the 24 car behind it they are at the very start of pit lane on the right there as the 65 now we're not mentioning a great deal about Panish Racing but winners for the first time last time out two months ago and Le Mans podium finishers yes. as well they've had they're in a rich vein of form right now and great to see this hard-working team rewarded for the efforts they've been putting in for half a decade in this class. And uh, the 65 car has been there and thereabouts so often, but finally managed to put it, work, put it together as we've got a fleet of uh, LMP2 cars coming down the hill now. That's the Edex Sport car going through at full tilt. You can see how low that was running, smoke from the back of the car and the two G-Drive cars on their outlap. So this will be Patrick Piglet on a flying lap, as is Mathieu Lehay, as is Sergio Campana in the BHK Motorsport car. Tinkles back out again, so that really was a very quick adjustment, whether it was tyres from one side of the car to the other or just a slight tyre pressure adjustment, not sure. Uh, but he was only in the pits for 
Do we get times for pit stops? Uh, no, not we don't. This one. It's not in this no. session, but it was a very short time, rest assured. And uh, the 34 car is circulating once again. So 12 cars in the session to finish the point about Panis Racing. They started the year with a 14th place finish at Red Bull Ring, eighth place then at uh, Ricard. No, I'm just going on James Allen's results here, so I've missed the opening round. But anyway, we'll deal with Red Bull Ring where they finish 14th, eighth at Ricard, and then the win at Monza. Um, they did rather better, I think, from Barcelona, but didn't, they weren't uh, race winners, crucially, because after so, so long, and I couldn't quite believe that statistic in Italy, they finally took the biggest trophy in ELMS. And as you say, it's amazing what a good result or a shot in the arm can be to then produce a podium at Le Mans. This is a fighting lap from Patrick Pile. He's wrangling this one like an, angry, like an angry cat. It does seem to be kind of fighting back a little bit here. But uh, Patrick at the moment with two purple sectors in this session. So this will be a bit of a, well, high-speed banker, I guess, for the 28 car. Just about to cross the line and will be the first car to register a flying lap and the mark for everybody else to try to beat is a 2.06.089 loses it to track limits for turn <laughs> 9 so still with 4 minutes to go not one car has registered a flying lap Mathieu Lahey it is that comes through with a 2.06.962 and uh, turn nine, if you weren't aware, by the way, speaker's corner. So uh, people being done on several occasions on the exit of that corner. Uh, to drop four wheels over the white line. But that is no excuse, of course. Last year's pole position was a 133.9. I'm trying to remember whether that was in dry conditions. I think it was. It was the weekend uh, prior to the World Endurance Championship weekend when they were held back to back uh, August last year. Let's celebrate for a moment. BHK Motorsport briefly go to the top of time and score with a 206.4. But that's bettered almost immediately with a yellow flag at turn one. Uh, Louis Delatraz, a 204.762. Ferdi Habsburg, 204.806. Who's off? It's BHK is yes, off. Was. Went, to, went to provisional pole briefly and went off uh, in sympathy, I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, the remaining United Autosports car, green flag as the BHK car manages to get back on track. It's Delatraz from Habsburg, Rene Binder for Duquesne, James Allen for Panis, Sergio Campana and Mattia Lahey. They are the cars that have completed the flying lap. Phil Hansen uh, went purple in the first sector and it's about to complete his lap. Will this be good enough to knock off WRT? Uh, not before Charles Malaisi has his say. Uh, Charles Malaisi, a winner at Le Mans for uh, WRT here with Cool Racing puts the prime effort up to uh, provisional pole with a 204384. Here comes Hansen, second. Phil Hansen for United Autosports behind the Pro-Am entered cool racing car of Charles Milesi. You can forget about that fastest lap from last year. I was reading you the Monza time and managed to shave 30 <laughs> seconds off it. I thought it was something strange about a 133 around Spa. 203.2 was the time I was hunting around for. That was a Philly Bauberkirk uh, uh, session or uh, time rather. This time it's his teammate Phil Hansen who's down in the mid 204s but we've got a bit of a way to go to last year because of course the cars have changed year on year. Hansen set second fastest time despite setting purple sectors in the first and third sectors. Malaysia's second sector that did the damage to Phil Hansen's immediate hopes of a pole setting time but Hansen responds with purple again in sector one. He's 0.132 of a second down on the own Frenchman. 204.384 for Charmi Lacy, 0.132 of a second, back to Phil Hansen, second, and then it's Louis Delatraz and Patrick Pile with in the, the engine note in the background is that of Nick de Vries, who is heading now out of Le Combe corner with Bruxelles in the distance. Plenty of curve being taken on the exit of turn seven as well for the Dutchman. His head's moving around like crazy in the cockpit there. That's the reason why those, those sponge pads either side of the helmet to just vaguely keep his head in the right direction. Phil Hansen, a big moment coming out of Lefania corner there. Just about came in, kept it on the straight and narrow, but I think this lap will be deleted because he was way off the track. So, uh, fabulous first sector for Phil Hansen. A poor second sector, courtesy of that off-track moment for the number 22 car. So it's Malaysia from Hansen. Louis Delatraz third. 
the Team WRT car. Patrick Pile fourth and going very well indeed here. Could improve on this lap. Patrick Pile, Rennie Binder with a good lap for Duquesne team. Ferdy Habsburg having lost one lap to track limits uh, gets on the board in his sixth fastest. Here comes the number 22 car. And interestingly, lap five, it said no further action for the 22 car. So they'd obviously judged that the moment coming out of Lafania wasn't gaining him any time. He was certainly involved in a big moment, which he gathered up. And that lap will be legitimate. It's just that it won't count as a better one. Pile crosses that checkered flag. Uh, Pile improves and goes to fourth. So 204.516 is still Hansen's best time. Patrick Pile locked into fourth or no better at least. Whereas a moment or two ago, Harry Tinknell dropped the rear left into the into the gravel at Camper's corner and just about gathered things up in time for Kerr Paul Frere. Well, that will have really dramatically slowed. And the celebrations have started at uh, EDEC. Fourth, they're happy Fourth with that. Place. Okay, fair enough. I just I'm slightly puzzled by the fact that they were high fiving one another. But Charles Milesi is in a good position for cool racing, and Phil Hansen, having done a, a 36.2 through the first sector, is now in the middle one. He's up though on the pole setting time, courtesy of a better first sector than the pole setter managed to do. Phil Hansen, can he do anything about this? It's all going to be about this middle sector where Milesi did the damage on his pole setting lap. Plenty of these cars already home. Louis Delatras, by the way, has bailed out of his final uh, lap. He'll do no better than third. G-Drive Racing's pair will no, do be no better than seventh or eighth. Harry Tinkler comes home ninth. So it's a question of whether Hansen can carry this predicted pace through the rest of the two set, uh, sectors because he's gone quicker than Charles Milesi managed through sector one. But I think Milesi finds more time in sector two and three. And it, oh, he's backed out of him. He's bailed out of him massively. He's now six seconds down. Absolutely so. So that means Milesi should be locked in because there's only Rene Binder still circulating. No, that's done. Still he's, he's in the pits now as well. So it will be Charles Malaysi on his first appearance for Cool Racing, the 37 car, a pro am entry, will take pole position here at the four hours of Spa Francorchamps. And that is the second time this year that a pro am car has started from pole position, with well, Racing Team Turkey doing it at uh, Red Bull Ring. Well, well, well. So it shows, doesn't it, that uh, the cars are absolutely no different, which we knew, and it's all about the drivers that you plug into them. And Charles Milesi, for me, was a well, it was a talent uh, before he entered into ACO rules racing, but has come to the fore now because he's taken uh, was it pole at Le Mans as well as a good result. I'd have to go back and think, think, yeah, think and check. But it, it certainly was he was involved in hyperpole on the Thursday night, definitely. And Charmy Lacey has also uh, flirted with pole positions in the World Endurance Championship as well. He's only 20 years old, uh, Frenchman, but uh, can hustle one of these prototypes around any sort of track and uh, to the first pole position for cool racing of this season because prior to that, G-Drive Racing with three uh, poles and Racing Team Turkey with the other. Well, add that now, add to that now, the 37 car, Cool Racing. 38 Jota car set pole position at Le Mans. It was the 41 WRT car was second on that grid. Yes. Um, but uh, it's not his first outing, is it, in the LMS either? He started for, was it Dragon Speed early in the season? Uh, OK, yeah, may well have been. I can look that up as well. We'll uh, just recap the times scrolling through. Edex Sport in fourth position then, and they were very, very happy with that. But uh, well done to Cool Racing. And the 37 car in a very tricky session to judge because if you put yourself in the shoes of LMP2 drivers, not only were they having to be ready for their scheduled start time, but also aware that it could be delayed. And then it was delayed yet further because of a horrible accident for Nico, Nico Jama during the LMP2 session itself, which brought out the red flags for the second time during ELMS qualifying. Uh, the answer is it's his fifth different LMP2 team in two years. He wow. started the Le Mans 24 hours last year with So24 by Graf. He did a one-off race with Dragon Speed last year. Team WRT, of course, for the full season in WC. Yeah, so uh, a real talent of the moment, not even for the future, because, uh, as you say, five different teams already in ELMS. By the time we catch up with the man with Hayley.
Uh, I'm down here joined by pole sitter, uh, number car, driver of car number 37 for Cool Racing, Charles Manessi. First outing for Cool Racing and you get pole. What a great yeah. result. First oh. time. <laughs> First time this year in LMS um, with Cool Racing. I, I think we did an incredible job. Sorry. Yeah, I think we did an incredible job straight away from, from Friday. Hopefully I was not able to be there uh, on, on uh, Wednesday because I got sick last week and uh, not COVID, but uh, I was in hospital for two days and uh, so being on pole now is quite amazing and uh, I think the team did an amazing job through through the week and last week when I went to the workshop and uh, so I think for the moment it's still incredible to be on pole here and uh, I think that's we know that we had the pace to be in top three or top five, but to be on pole now is a bit uh, quite surprising uh, to be so so high in, uh, in the top. And uh, yeah, I think that's great for the team, great for me. After my pole position in Monza in WEC, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Charles. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I, I knew there was a pole position that I remembered somewhere along the way. So in WEC at Monza, Charmy Lacey had taken pole. That's it. We're very, very late, obviously. We'll join us for the race tomorrow, 22.11 local time start. Bye for now.